Bob, how I met him, how I, um, we, we did used to work together. I'm not in his de department anymore and I still miss him. And it's been, you know, 10 or 12 years, but talk about how I met Bob and the history of his activism here in Columbus. And Michael and I both talked about why um, this is, a, the book is important and it's so timely. Um, it, it started, I think Bob really, it grew from an idea that he had during the uh, demonstrations in uh, Virginia, uh, during the administration of uh, Trump. And um, he, and, and I, I, we often talked about that I would say to him, you've got to write about this stuff because he knew so much and he was up on everything. And so he and Michael were introduced and um, they did in fact do that. Um, Bob's part is, is this history of these groups in Ohio and it goes uh, way back. They had asked me last night um, what I was surprised to learn uh, in each part of the book. And for Bob, I, don't, I have never seen uh, someone put together um, a history of how these groups are funded. They could not exist without funding. And Bob has traced all that, um, you know, where the funding comes from, how it gets to people, how they're recruited. Uh, um, and Bob and our, our late colleague, colleague uh, Judy Gentry wrote, oh, probably 15, 20 years ago, um, a paper about uh, hate groups in Ohio and how the internet was helping that cause uh, along. So that was my surprise in, in, in uh, Bob's part of the book uh, that, that he traced the economic history of this and that um, a lot of the money is coming from the Midwest, but also a lot of these groups, when you start going backwards and looking at where they came from, as he said, all roads lead to Ohio. So um, I, uh, we had a great time. We run for about 90 minutes, talk, took, some, took a lot of really good questions. And um, everybody sends uh, Bob their their best, and uh, is looking forward to seeing him back on the on the road again with uh, the book. I did send an email today to the library to see if there's a link that we can use that people can use so that they can listen to the conversation. I've not heard back yet, but when I do, I will uh, give that to Suzanne, and she can post it to people. I think I already have it, but I'll, I'll yeah, if, if I don't, I'll, I'll make sure they do that too. Okay. Because I, I saw it last night. You did a very good job. Thanks, Marilyn, for Thank staying you. in on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Don, I guess you're going to introduce the professor a little bit about the, and the upcoming event. Uh, I did want to say that, you know, this 9-11 plus 20 idea is all over the place. People are doing this uh, quite, quite, I don't know if you, every channel you're watching today, they were doing something about 9-11, not necessarily in the perspective that we wanted to bring it in. So I want us to really understand that, you know, we, we're coming from it from a, a different direction than some of the, the uh, regular folks <laughs> might have thought. Um, these past 20 years have brought Islamic phobia to the fore. It has brought hate, as we just heard about um, uh, from the book, the recent book. Uh, it, it has long history, but these last 20 years has really been strong. So yeah, Don, if you can bring uh, uh, up, uh, us up on what the event is that is going on and then, and then maybe introduce the uh, professor, please. Certainly, thank you so much. Don, you just went silent. I don't know what happened. I think you done. I was sorry. There you go. Hello. You're good now. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and put in the chat the event. Um, so uh, Tuesday night, I'm with Cleveland Peace Action uh, Middle East Committee, and uh, we're we're bringing in Professor Oliver Boyd Barrett on Tuesday night uh, on Zoom and in person for a, a, a discussion at a library in Parma, Ohio. Uh, the professor will be on Zoom from California, and uh, I see Tom Sodders is on. He's a partner in crime uh, in the uh, in the Cleveland Peace Action Board, 
And he was he helped facilitate getting in touch with Oliver Boyd Barrett first off. But our, our event is a war, peace and propaganda, the U.S. in the Middle East. Uh, we were and he's an expert on Syria and uh, and Iraq and Iran as well. And we were very concerned at Cleveland Peace Action about the fact that uh, President Biden went ahead and uh, laid bombs out in uh, Iraq and, and Syria, like in the first week of his presidency and then again. And we see it as a proxy war in Iran. And either way, it's, it's all illegal under international law. And we hardly hear a peep uh, of, of opposition. So we want to get to the bottom of it. And uh, we, we found uh, Oliver Boyd Barrett through another member, Jeff Kasuf. And um, so that's Tuesday night. And if you just go on Cleveland Peace Action website, it's in the chat there. You can get, it's at the top of the page and you can register for the online event or the uh, in-person event in Parma, Ohio, seven o'clock Tuesday night. Thank you for that. And uh, I can go ahead and tell you a little bit about the professor that will be on tonight as well. So Professor Oliver Boyd Barrett, he's an expert uh, on communications, media, and U.S. foreign policy. And, uh, and also how the taxpayers, Congress, and world leaders are manipulating and supporting endless wars for empire and our occupations around the world. Professor Boyd Barrett has written or edited some 25 books and 150 scholarly articles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's actually a very personable gentleman. We, we met with him on Zoom with our committee. And I just, uh, I'm looking forward to our event uh, on Tuesday and of course tonight too. So thank you so much. Thanks, Don. Don and I've got long activism history together and uh, out at the nuclear test site as well as other places. So thank you, Don, it's good seeing you. And uh, Professor, please go forward. Yeah. Professor, he might not be here. What's his full name again? Don B uh, Don Boyd Don Barrett. Yeah, Boyd Barrett. Yep. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not seeing any Boyd. B O Y D. Okay. Yeah, he's not here. Okay. All right. Well, let's just move on to. Uh, we'll get back to him when he jumps on. He, he's in the middle of a family thing and he wanted to be a little later. So oh, it true. might not have worked, but uh, Daoud, are you ready to jump on now with, with some, some of your perspective as well? And, and then Selena, you're on as well. So please um, share as well if you want to. Thank you. For sure. Um, we're gonna have- Daoud is a active, okay. activist. Yeah, uh, Dawood is an activist with the Students for Peace and Just uh, uh, for ah, <laughs> Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, and please go ahead. So we actually, I actually contacted Angelina, our SJP president, to help cover all these aspects. It's highly complex, so I just needed a second hand uh, trying to cover everything. A part of this, so we're mainly talking about the marginalization of the marginalized groups that. Um, and the struggles they have faced post 9-11. Perfect. So Angelina, start us off. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us today. Hi. I, I, we didn't really know the format of this, so our presentation is a little bit more formal. Um, but again, thank you so much for having us. And I wanted to start off with a quick question. So the, one, the question that I was asking is, what is the one commonality between um, Americans killed on 9-11, so Iraqi civilians brutalized in American war crimes, marginalized brown and Muslim communities in America, and Palestinians living in an uh, open air prison. And the commonality is fear. So 9-11 and its exceptionalization as a violent tragedy has placed fear at the forefront. Sorry. As place here at the forefront of our collective experience. And we, you know, as Americans, Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, and all those affected by 9-11 operate under a fear-based approach. 
So Americans would be afraid of Middle Eastern terrorism sort of breaching the West. Muslim Americans are afraid of individual and structural instances of racism and Iraqis, Afghanis and other Middle Easterners are afraid, you know, of American militarism and, you know, their fear based tactics. So fear, you know, from what, I, what we've seen has prevented us from taking on a multifaceted analysis of 9-11 and its aftermath, um, not only on American soil, but also abroad. And we believe that 9-11 is the cataclysmic interaction between the East and the West that has led to the justification of invasion and the dehumanization of the Middle East and simultaneously the invasion of privacy here on American soil. So due to this heavy set Islamophobia that, remain, that exists in America, the Patriot Act was enacted on October 6, 2001, which expanded the government's surveillance with no proper checks and balances to that power, uh, meaning that the American government could surveil any American citizen secretly, and those citizens could not contest those, those claims against them, um, which, which in turn leads to a lack of public accountability. So the passage of the Patriot Act allows for a normalized uh, systematic discri discrimination of American uh, or Arab, Muslim, and Brown Americans in the, in the United States, um, which, in, which includes workplace discrimination and the acquisition, uh, acquisition of secret evidence and heightened invasion of privacy or invasions of privacy, which incurs in their homes and their places of worship. Um, and then they had a bunch of uh, new government agencies enacted, such as the uh, TSA and the DHS, um, which implemented very heavily discriminatory no-fly lists and unethical security screenings that, that Muslims, would, Muslims and Arabs and brown Americans would face daily. Um, and the Patriot Act permits government officials to how do I say this, deem any political um, dissent as domestic terrorism. So any conflict and any conflicts they may seem with the American government could be deemed like terrorist, like with terrorist ideologies, um, which which very heavily jeopardizes the personal and political freedoms of an American citizen. Um, and in turn, this Patriotic Act, um, this Patriot Act in Section 15 violates the Fourth Amendment in a, in a way where government officials could retrieve data from third party sources without any proper search warrants. We um, also, in our research that we did today, uh, the, this abusive invasion of privacy isn't limited just to um, the Patriot Act here on American soil, but also abroad. So specifically, uh, several major American lobbying groups, uh, specifically Zionist, lobbying organizations and companies, along with other large um, educational and governmental institutions. They actually fund surveillance technology to Israel, and that's weaponized against the Palestinian people. And this surveillance is, for the most part, inextricably tied to the legacy of colonialism or American-sponsored colonialism in occupied Palestine. So for example, Israel makes extensive use of identification cards, biometric information uh, to control the movement and the rights of Palestinian people within those territories. So I think actually in 2009, uh, the Israeli Knesset, so that's the Congress there, they actually passed a, an act to create a huge computer database with biometric uh, information. So like fingerprints, iris, like eye information, DNA, a whole bunch of stuff, um, all about Israeli citizens and Palestinian citizens. And also the IDF would do extensive wiretapping and they would use drop on like phone conversations uh, foreign journalists and Arab uh, Israelis, so Arabs of you, people who are ethnically Arab, but they live on the Israeli, you know, controlled side. So for the most part, they use, Israel uses this surveillance technology as a conduit to confiscate Palestinian land, carry out targeted attacks of the Palestinian civilians, to violate their social and civil rights, and to prevent their right of return. And these fear-based tactics are not only enforced by the surveillance technology, but also by the various Israeli government departments, including the military, the Congress, and other, you know, judicial court systems. So on every single level, there is that, you know, fear-based tactics that are used to disenfranchise Palestinians living there. So as us Palestinian Americans living in diaspora, we feel helpless because we inadvertently fund our own oppression. So we, so the U.S. don't or gives foreign aid to Israel in a form of three point eight billion dollars annually. Um, and then furthermore, highly influential companies that dominate all the markets of the United States, 
such as our industrial, such as our technology, technological and food-based companies, um, happen to be the primarily monetary contributors to the Palestinian oppression. Um, dominant lobbyist institutions work diligently in the oppression of the Palestinian people, for example, the APAC, the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, um, work to increase US funded aid to, towards Israel, which contributes to um, military aid and the formation of development and uh, research strategy used to violently displace Palestinians living within the confinement of uh, illegal Israeli settlements. So as a result of extensive lobbying through the US Congress, Israel is the top recipient of US foreign assistance um, and that is highly dangerous to Palestinian people. Yeah, so this brings us back to BDS. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of it. Um, that's the Palestinian Direct Call to Action from the Palestinian Civil Society. Uh, what it stands for is Boycott Divestment Sanctions. So basically they're calling um, us Americans especially to divest from the financial, educational, you know, academic, um, any institution that supports the Israeli apartheid regime. So that can mean things like, you know, Sabra Hummus, uh, Sabra Hummus like here on campus, or, you know, APAC, the, um, I think it's the American Israeli uh, Political uh, Public Affairs Committee, like all of the lobbying that they do, basically they're calling to a swift end and a boycott to all of those things. So in short, um, the United States isn't just complicit in the war crimes against Palestinians, but they play an active role in the intentional and severe um, deprivation of their fundamental rights under international law. So to conclude this all, the post 9-11 surveillance, post surveillance, surveillance techniques have been completely immoral, immoral to the marginalized groups that, that they targeted. So therefore we demand an immediate call to action to protect, the, to protect the civil liberties entitled to not only Americans, but the international civilians impacted by these aggressive foreign policy, uh, by the impressive US foreign policy in, in placed upon them. Thank, thank, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Yeah, it stood us for Justin Palestine has been a, a long standing organization in Columbus originally Committee for Peace and Justice, and then our, I keep on wanting to say Peace and Justice, Justice in Palestine. Um, but they have just uh, re restarted their, their work on campus uh, this past week, week and a half, and I'm very happy to, to see that they are going to be organizing and continuing to work. Um, the whole uh, effort around BDS and other issues of bringing the Palestinian cause forward, uh, please, please consider free press as a uh, community as being part of uh, that way to get that word out if possible. Um, so, uh, do we have uh, the professor on yet or not? We'll, we'll have more to talk later as we go forward. We try to rip through everybody real quick and then, uh, but thank you, Dode and, and uh, Angelina and Selena for everybody, for, for all your work. And it's been fun working with you guys this summer as well. Um, trying, to, trying to get B BDS restarted in Columbus again. Um, do we have the professor on yet? If not, Sandy, uh, can you go ahead? That's just not on yet. Yeah, I don't yeah, see him in yet. I don't know, Don or Tom. Yeah, De Don. Don said that he wasn't getting his, his uh, the, the link didn't come through. So let's, Sandy, are you on? I am. Okay, why don't you go ahead and then hopefully he'll he'll get it together before then. Is somebody, send, is somebody, somebody sending him the link? Yeah, Don yeah. just did. Uh, okay, I'll go then. Um, so I was asked to talk about the 9-11, um, the, the and the fallout as a veteran. And um, I've been a veteran for a very long time. I enlisted in the military in 1978. Um, and I did so for every reason in the book. I mean, just three of them were college tuition, travel and patriotism. And I can tell you, if you knew me back then, it was a deep and sincere patriotism. Patriotism was never for me a blind, love it or leave it allegiance to my country. On the contrary, it stemmed from a feeling that Americans could freely discuss and even question what made us the greatest country that had ever existed on the face of the earth. 
at that time, I knew we had made some mistakes, that genocide, slavery, Vietnam, and, and those kind of things. But when I enlisted in the, late, in the late 1970s, it seemed as if we as a country were correcting those errors, shall we say, those errors in judgment. I felt that we were making progress as the beacon of democracy in which I saw myself, one that values liberty and justice for all. So what does all this have to do with 9-11? By 2001, I no longer fully subscribed to the greatest country in the world concept. I've lived overseas um, off and on for many years, too many years, to swallow that hole. I should note that this was due to the U.S. Army in part, greatly, actually greatly due to it. It was my stint as a soldier in Germany in the early 1980s that sparked my interest in traveling around the world, which I did eventually uh, living and teaching in Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia. My experiences abroad filled me with an appreciation of the greatness of other people in their countries and the destruction wrought by U.S. policies around the globe. I really had not known or understood this before. By 20, 2001, I was seeing less the promise of a more perfect union in the United States than the unraveling of whatever progress Americans had eked out in the last um, half of the um, last century, the 20th century. Nevertheless, on 9-11 of that same year, as my heart grieved seeing those planes purposely puncture crowded buildings and killing thousands of innocent people, I wondered if this would be a turning point for the U.S. in a good way. All around the country, Americans were asking, why do they hate us? I didn't even think that was the right question to be asking, but okay, at least it was something about other people. Um, I was certain that this would lead us to a national discussion about our place and policies in the world. People seemed sincere about uh, trying to understand what was going on. It was a surprise for them. I'd lived overseas and lots of other countries have terrorist attacks. I, I, I figured it would happen here one day, but um, I guess it did on 9-11. At any rate, I was wrong about that full on discussion about what we could do or what was going on. Within two days, instead, officials were already talking about attacking Afghanistan. We were ready to bomb ordinary Afghanistans, Af Afghanis. Within a week, um, war talk pushed out discussions of, real, of any real substance regarding the reasons for the terrorist attack of 9-11 and ways to peacefully address them, at least in the mainstream media. I wanna thank you, the Columbus Free Press, Democracy Now!, Mark Stansberry's, bus trips to DC to protest war and Connie Hammond's peace vigils on 15th and high. They were weekly. Um, these and other outlets were essential during these TD days that's, um, in which people like us sought to head off the war. And just as an aside, when people find out I'm a veteran, they often say, thank you for your service. Let me just say to all you peace veterans, the real heroes of this country, thank you for your service. In the days after 9-11, as officials in mainstream media prepared for war and poured resources into galvanizing American support for it, because it wasn't there initially, my thoughts turned to the soldiers, both Afghani and Americans. It made me think back to when I was a soldier and learned that the U.S. was sending troops to fight in Central America. I opposed this move. I didn't see any reason for it. And I remember asking myself, if ordered, would I go? I generally considered both options and never did finalize an answer. But what was hypothetical, what was a hypothetical question for me then was a real, very real one for the men and women in uniform in 2001. After 9-11, as the throng for war against Afghanistan grew stronger and stronger, I was telling anyone in earshot if that if we really want to have a war over this, we would be better off bombing, I don't know, Canada, Scotland, Germany, Australia, just anywhere but Afghanistan. Why is this? No foreign power has been able to conquer the various ethnic groups entrenched in this mountainous terrain. They're independent, they don't want us, they know how to fight. Also, Afghanis were not responsible for 9-11. The pe these people did not have any control over bin Laden or any of the warlords financed and armed by foreigners, such as the United States. We had more control than your average Afghani. And also because the soldiers um, Afghanis and Americans, be, because of the soldiers, Americans and Afghanis, the latter who often had little choice about being a warrior, much less on which side to fight. 
when militias rampage through villages seeking young males for their for the forces, they're not exactly asking for volunteers. Americans, on the other hand, have that choice. But do they really? Seriously, how much of a choice is it for those living in towns without good job prospects, but plenty of far right media um, saturating the airwaves with propaganda, applauding war as the true patriotic answer? My opposition to the war in Afghanistan is largely due to my experiences as a soldier and as a person who traveled widely abroad. I'm always amazed, therefore, at those of you who arrived at the same conclusion back here in the US. How did you know what I had no clue about until after enlist enlisting and meeting people abroad? And I don't know if I have any more time, but if I do, that would be a question I'd like to throw out. You know, why did people here automatically know to uh, work for peace um, and not go to war? What was your what were your inclinations? What were you thinking on 9-11? But again, I don't know if I have any time to ask that question or, or, um, or entertain those responses, but so I'll leave it to Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Mark, you got some bandwidth problems maybe. Uh, Steven, the community uh, can, can, in the midst of war, in the midst of, of propaganda that, that has really pro uh, promoted Islamophobia, uh, racism, hatred, um, war, militarism as response. Oliver, Oliver hi. Boyd. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Mark, Mark, you broke up. Your bandwidth is real low, and you just kind of froze here. So. And military. That's. Uh, really understand that war okay. propaganda uh, and that whole issue that we want the professor to talk about when he comes on. Um, Sandy, your question is very, uh, very important. How do people come to uh, uh, that point in life to, to, to break off from what um, is spoon fed us daily um, through our media, through, through our politicians, through our families as well? Um, so it, there, there, there is that discussion that we have to have within our community. Stephen, did uh, Boyd Barrett come on yet? Yeah. Okay, why don't we uh, jump to the professor and, and then we'll try to get into a little discussion then. Thanks everybody so far for your presentation. Uh, I hope you understand that we are just one of many uh, reflections on what 9-11 uh, plus 20 has been. Um, but we, our community was involved prior to 9-11 and we're gonna be involved with trying to understand how to resist and be a a community of resistance, uh, building a new world. So please uh, go ahead, uh, Professor. Hi, um, I apologize. I had some technical difficulties at this end. I'm not using my usual equipment. I'm down here in uh, San Diego, uh, as opposed to my usual place of residence, which is in uh, Ojai, north of Los Angeles. It's great to speak to you all. Do you have a specific question for me or what, what would you like me to do or say? Well, we understood you, you, you know war, propaganda and all that. So if you wanted to speak about, uh, we're, we're doing a 9-11 a plus 20 event tonight. And so uh, if you want to contribute, I don't know how much you've heard of our conversation already, uh, but we've, oh we've had uh, quite the, the diverse uh, uh, perspectives uh, brought forward to, to look at uh, what has the last 20 years meant for uh, communities that are trying to be in resistance to war and propaganda. Yeah. And the, uh, th th thank you, Mark. And thank you uh, so much for this opportunity to, to meet with you. 
uh, and also to be back in contact with that wonderful city of Columbus, uh, Ohio, uh, which used to be my home, though I'm now based in, down here in Los Angeles. So my, the, the main thing that I study is the pretexts uh, for war, uh, particularly during the, the so-called uh, global war on terror. But as I'm sure that uh, most of your listeners well understand, uh, when we're talking about uh, US interventionism based on false pretexts, uh, we, we are looking at, uh, but approximately uh, at my age, uh, I can always tell how many years this has been going on because I was born in 1945. And since 1945, we've had an unending uh, history succession of uh, uh, US wars uh, in, uh, for, for which the, the, the pretexts are usually totally false. Uh, and uh, if that wasn't bad enough, they are also usually uh, totally counterproductive uh, from any human uh, definition of what might be in the interests of the majority uh, of the citizens of the United States. I know, of course, this is 9-11, uh, and naturally, uh, as I'm sure that you've been talking about already, uh, we're particularly interested in uh, 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 the, the events of 9-11 themselves, and uh, then also the subsequent wars that constitute the so-called war on terror. So I'm going to, I, I hope I'm not going to cover too much ground that you've already been talking about, uh, but uh, it's relevant to think about the justification or lack thereof for our invasion of Afghanistan in, uh, in, 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 in 2001. So uh, as is usually the case, uh, we lurched into action long before we had any meaningful evidence as to who our enemies were and what exactly uh, we think that, uh, that, 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 that they did. Um, so long before any evidence had actually been collected, long before there was any, uh, any pretense that evidence from, uh, from Congress or from the 9-11 uh, commission long before then uh, we decided that we knew the answer and the answer was bomb the hell uh, out of Afghanistan, bomb the hell in particular out of the Taliban uh, whom we accused of giving shelter to Osama bin Laden whom we accused of being behind the 9-11 attacks. Well the truth is uh, there's very little evidence to show that the Dal Taliban had any conscious uh, involvement whatsoever in the events of 9-11. Uh, I still to this day am waiting to see uh, the evidence that Osama bin Laden actually was the brains behind 9-11. Uh, that would be really nice to see at this point in history 20 years uh, further down the line. Uh, but, but, but of course we don't because we killed him and uh, the people who are charged uh, with the actual events of 9-11 are still waiting um, to be tried, not tried in any normal court, but tried in a military court, and the United States can't even get their act together sufficiently to push that through. Uh, so we're talking about something incredibly strange uh, when we're talking about our invasion of 9-11 uh, and the fall, uh, fall to uh, winter of uh, 2001. The Taliban uh, would have been quite happy to have handed uh, Osama bin Laden over to us, uh, but they actually um, because they're quite sensible people, uh, they said, well, absolutely, but, you know, show us the evidence. But did the United States have any evidence to show or that it wanted to show to the Taliban? No, it didn't. It decided to, uh, to invade uh, anyway. So the Taliban are uh, 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 desperate, uh, remotest, uh, most horrible enemies, right? No, no, wrong. The Taliban were not our most horrible enemies because uh, we had spent, uh, well, first of all, we were responsible uh, in alliance with uh, Saudi Arabia, with, uh, with Pakistan, uh, in inventing the Taliban back in the 1980s to get rid of Russia. We didn't call them the Taliban then, they didn't call themselves the Taliban, but we supported the, the so-called Mujahideen. And we even invented a radical new, new form of Sunni Islam that would uh, pump uh, uh, young uh, uh, Muslim uh, men up with anger uh, against, uh, initially against, uh, against Russia, uh, to provide them with the ideological fuel to beat the hell out of uh, out of the Russians who had invaded uh, uh, had invaded Afghanistan um, in um, uh, 1970. 
1979-1980. Uh, what, what, what were the Russians doing, by the way, in Afghanistan uh, that we so badly needed to kick them out? Well, actually, they were responding to uh, provocations that we had set uh, under the Carter regime uh, as a result of the uh, foreign policy advice of uh, Brzezinski, um, um, th this, this nutty uh, totally obsessively anti-Russian uh, foreign policy advisor that somehow managed to scramble his way up to the top of the foreign policy establishment in the United States. And he said the right way to, to handle uh, the civil war uh, in Afghanistan uh, was to get the CIA to begin to destabilize the relatively pro-Moscow uh, uh, regime by, under, under Taraki, uh, the prime minister at that, uh, he, he'd only been in power for about a year. There was a succession of, uh, of coup d'etats uh, following the, um, the overthrow uh, against the, the king of Afghanistan in 1973. Uh, so uh, Brzezinski, and he, he, he boasts of this, uh, later on he, he, he boasted of this, uh, extraordinary accomplishment, as he saw it, of, uh, of uh, uh, seducing Russia into his own Vietnam quagmire. Well, how ridiculous does that sound now after uh, we spent 20 years in exactly the same quagmire uh, from uh, 2001 to 2021, with even less to show for it than the, uh, than the Russians. So, um, Moving ahead into the mid-1990s, we get very, very friendly with the Taliban, although we know that they're fundamentalist uh, Islam, who have been uh, spiked uh, with this uh, false form of uh, Islam uh, by us. We, uh, the, uh, uh, the CIA recruited uh, academics here in the United States to, to come up with some kind of is Islamic narrative that would justify a, a totally wacky, um, warlike, um, anti uh, Islam, basically form of Islam, uh, that would be sufficient to uh, persuade young men to lay down their lives willingly for martyrdom uh, in getting rid of the, uh, the, the, so they're still there in the, uh, in the 1990s, and by this time we're warming up to the Taliban because it looks as though they may actually be able to bring about security in uh, Afghanistan. Well, why would that matter to us? Because we wanted to lay pipelines across Afghanistan um, under the leadership of UNICAL, um, and um, in the middle, middle mid 1990s, we have a, a delightful party of uh, Taliban leaders come out to Houston uh, to talk about uh, laying pipelines across the, across Afghanistan. The whole trick is to get the the, the oil and the gas out of uh, out of the Caspian Sea, bring it across Afghanistan, bring it down into India. As the idea was, where it was going to be received none other but <laughs> than, uh, than Enron. Um, was going to be taking the, uh, the oil and the gas in from one of his many plants uh, in India, which, by the way, was a total economic flop, but never mind. Uh, then come uh, getting towards the end of the 1990s, uh, the United States decides it doesn't like the Taliban after all, because first of all, the Taliban have not been able to prove uh, they, that they can bring about security in Afghanistan. Well, who can? Good luck with that. And, um, and also because it had, the Taliban had the bright idea of insisting on the payment of uh, transit fees uh, for the uh, for the pipelines for the oil and the gas uh, pipelines, I think it's some miserable amount, like one hundred thousand dollars a year. But the United States decides, nah, we don't want to pay this, and uh, so uh, they 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 fought out of love uh, with the uh, with the with the, with the Taliban. So the Taliban, of course, after nine eleven, be after two thousand one, uh, or overnight, they 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 become the uh, the enemies du, du jour. And uh, we decide to, to, to obliterate them. But of course we don't, we, we say that we have. Um, because, and so why, why should it be so difficult to, to get rid of the, the Taliban, uh, even though we think we have defeated them um, by the end or by January 2002, is not too difficult to understand because the Taliban are primarily an ethnic group. They're based in the Pashtun, they're the majority uh, ethnic group in Afghanistan. Stand. They'll always be around. They will always be the uh, the dominant and most likely the most influential um, of the ethnic groups. In the, so it, it, it's it's they are culturally rooted, uh, and also they enjoy. They always have, and they continue to be. They have enjoyed considerable support from uh, Pakistan. Um, uh, and from the ISI, which is the intelligence service agencies of, uh, of, uh, of, of Pakistan. So anytime that we talk about the Taliban, we should also, all, we should always have in brackets, ISI, Pakistan, because the two are, um, it's almost impossible, they're inseparable. Um, we talk about national borders, there are no real national borders in Afghanistan. 
so the, the, the whole thing, therefore, the namely that our enemies uh, in Afghanistan are, uh, are, are the Taliban, they've got something weirdly, something to do with 9-11, which they haven't. Uh, does Osama bin Laden uh, have anything to do with 9-11? Um, I know many people would like to believe that he does. I'm still doubtful. I'm sure that he quite welcomed 9-11, uh, uh, given his ideology, but um, uh, the, we have not yet seen the evidence, and I don't believe the 9-11 Commission uh, provided us with the evidence. And if there was evidence, well, then why would uh, uh, Biden just uh, within the last few weeks, he's saying, okay, well, uh, if you insist, uh, let's actually reveal um, the data that we have from the FBI investigation into the causes of 9-11. So this is 20 years later. Biden is actually a big deal. He's, he's offering the public the possibility of declassifying a lot of the uh, records from the FBI investigation. Oh, well, why should he be doing that? Because um, not only are at least 50% of the US population totally aware that there's something incredibly sinister and problematic uh, about the events of 9-11 and the 9-11 Commission and its failure uh, to produce a convincing uh, evidence-based record of uh, what actually happened in 9-11. Uh, but also it's been patently clear to anyone who's been following this for some time that the Saudis, uh, state-backed agencies uh, from Saudi Arabia, are deeply implicated in the events of 9-11. Uh, and although no one ever dares to say this, um, the, the real problem for the United States is, should that ever be totally concluded, uh, at least from an official point of view, uh, then that certainly raises all kinds of questions because of the very close relationships between Saudi intelligence and U.S. intelligence. It seems to me totally unlikely and implausible that uh, Saudi intelligence, that there, was, there would be no leak uh, from the Saudi intelligence community into the uh, U.S. intelligence community that the Saudis were so deeply implicated in uh, in the events of. I mean, w were there any Taliban in uh, uh, within the population of hijackers? I, I don't think so, because uh, nearly all of the hijackers were uh, Saudi Saudi nationals. Many of them with military and uh, air force uh, uh, back backgrounds. The, the least likely kind of people, by the way, that you might think would uh, uh, be involved in an event like this. So. Um, so there you go. Biden is promising to declassify the uh, the records of, uh, of of 9 11. 20 years later, it, it seems to be a good idea, a good political gesture. Uh, just, I, I guess, the idea is. And by the way, does anyone ever explain whether it's uh, uh, <laughs> to what degree do we, should we trust? Uh, any offer from any a senior politician to declassify anything? How do we actually know? I mean, I, 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 see, I, I, put, I put this question out to the public. Someone out there might uh, have such a great understanding of the protocol of declassification of previously secret records that there's some way of actually knowing whether everything that should have been declassified has actually been declassified. Forgive me if I'm a skeptic, but uh, uh, I don't think there's any way myself from, 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 from my understanding of this, that you should ever trust anyone who tells you they're gonna declassify anything because it just seems to me to be so ob patently obvious that it's so easy to um, uh, not to de declassify the most damaging records that may be in, the, that may be in your possession. And besides which uh, politicians are, uh, on these kind of matters are, are simply tools uh, for the intelligence and um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the intelligence community and the, the Pentagon and the State Department and the, and the deep state who essentially control um, all, of these, all of these things. So, uh, so that's the start of it. And then uh, from one false pretext in Afghanistan, of course, we quickly move to the next false pretext, which is the false pretext of our invasion of, uh, of Iraq. And now we know from the Chilcot inquiry in Great Britain um, that uh, Tony Blair was saying to, uh, to George Bush, uh, in 2002, you remember 2002, Bush de declares his doctrine that anyone around the world who dares to threaten the hegemony of the United States uh, better look out because we'll take them down, essentially. That's the Bush doctrine. And Blair says to Bush, you know, um, oh, this is actually a little bit earlier, but going back into 2001, you know, because uh, there were some voices uh, in the Pentagon and the State Department who were saying, when we say voices, of course, we're talking about Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz uh, and the other neo Conservative gang who had predicted all of this through the uh, report for the New American uh, Project for the New American Century back in uh, 1998, just who, who were kind of salivating for just such an event as 9 11 to justify their takedown of uh, 
seven, as uh, Wesley Clark later revealed in 2006, confirmed by the Chilcot community, uh, Chilcot report of uh, in Great Britain in 2011, uh, that um, the plan was to take down seven Muslim nations in five years. That was the plan. And, and uh, uh, they succeeded to some extent, but not completely. So uh, Blair was saying to Bush, you know, you better not just go directly into uh, Iraq because that would look really odd. Why you, you have to take out Afghanistan first. And so it looks, it, it now looks as though Afghanistan was a kind of big, uh, a rather reluctant um, bid to secure, uh, to satisfy uh, popular lust for revenge. Uh, and, and to look relatively credible in this uh, launch of the of the global war on terror before moving on to what was the real target. The real target was uh, uh, was Iraq. And uh, then when we uh, dispensed with Iraq and now uh, sort of well, thrown back into the Stone Age, but totally counterproductive, because what did that bring about really other than a, a very cozy alliance um, between the, uh, the Shia uh, regime of uh, Iraq and the uh, Shia regime uh, of Iraq. See, none of these things ever pay us back in any meaningful way, other than uh, to those of us who are earning profits from the uh, defense from the defense industry. These are these are the only people, and and the politicians who uh, uh, scamper their way um, up the, the the greasy ladder to power uh, by promising to be tough on matters of war, they don't give a shit. Uh, how many uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions they're gonna kill, provided they get to where they're getting uh, on the basis of the money that, that, that's been given to them by APAC and the other uh, big pro-war uh, lobbyists who more or less control, uh, what is it, nine-tenths of, uh, of, of all of our politicians in Congress. And then, uh, so from Iraq, the next false pretext is, uh, is Libya. Uh, we take out Libya on the false pretext that, uh, that uh, Gaddafi, um, the leader, the, the, the founding father of a post-imperialist uh, Libya, uh, create, um, made Libya the, uh, the strongest black African nation in uh, Africa, the wealthiest black African nation with uh, socialism, distribution of wealth, free education, free healthcare, free housing, uh, all those. Uh, that's not good enough uh, because um, apparently he's a terrorist. Uh, and we took him out because uh, there, were, there, was, there were rumors, and that's all they were, and they weren't particularly credible rumors, given the sources they came from, that Gaddafi, Gaddafi's forces might move on Benghazi and uh, stage a massacre against his mainly al-Qaeda um, opponents uh, in Libya. But we wanted to pretend that al-Qaeda had nothing to do uh, with Libya, but it, it became very clear in a very short time after our destruction. Destruction is the only word you can use. This is utter destruction. It's sending nations back into the Stone Age. It's sending nations back into the uh, realms of slavery and, uh, and, and torture and, and splitting them up between warlords and ending up with two opposing governments. And this conflict is still ongoing, hasn't really been resolved, despite uh, claims to the contrary earlier this year, between uh, CIA asset Hiftar up in, uh, out in Tobruk, which is an oil and gas center in Libya and the US, uh, the UN supported uh, government in, uh, in uh, uh, Tripoli. And then we move on to the whole ghastly mess uh, of uh, Syria, Syria the, the, the claims that uh, Bashar Assad was a terribly evil uh, person um, uh, who was destroying uh, um, pro-democratic, uh, freedom-loving, uh, pro-democratic pro -dem uh, forces in uh, in Syria, I'm never going to argue that Bashar Assad is a saint, although he actually is a saint by contrast with the kind of people that we support in the Middle East. And I refer here to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Sisi in Egypt, and a few others. Uh, their records um, are very grim indeed if you compare it to the uh, record of uh, Bashar Assad, whom, by the way, we thought was a great leader back in the early 2000s uh, because he was making very positive noises about the need for um, a more accountable political uh, political system. And uh, he was talking about liberalizing the economy and privatizing uh, the economy. Uh, he probably didn't move nearly fast as he, enough. But the one thing about Syria that nobody seems to understand, everyone has so conveniently forgotten, is the history of the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, shenanigans uh, trying to destabilize, on behalf, of course, of the, the usual uh, anti-democratic uh, forces in the Arab world supported by the United States and the NATO powers, who used to be the imperial masters after the Ottomans in, uh, in, uh, in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And um, back to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, uh, who, who uh, tried to take take down 
uh, Bashar Assad's uh, father, Hafiz Assad, back in the mid 1980s. They committed terrible, terrible crimes. No one ever wants to remember that. Uh, all they want to remember is uh, that uh, Hafiz Assad uh, was able to win that struggle against the Muslim Brotherhood. And yes, there was a massacre uh, in homes uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s. And that was a, the clear and obvious and inevitable result uh, of an attempt uh, to destabilize and destroy uh, the, the Ba'athist regime of Syria, which by the way, is another example of a pro-socialist uh, redistribution of wealth, uh, gender equality, a secular uh, country and, and any country that dares to be secular, any country that really believes in equal relations between the sexes, apparently the United States opposes them, uh, but it doesn't mind uh, supporting uh, the, uh, the 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 the, um, uh, the the religious nutters uh, whom we've uh, prized into power uh, throughout the rest of the uh, throughout the rest of the the the, uh, the, 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 the Middle East. I, I don't mean to offend uh, anyone who is religious out there, uh, because I know that these regimes are not. It's not because they're religious that they're awful. Uh, it's because uh, they sit at the top of an incredibly unequal hierarchy of power, uh, which um, is uh, uses. Uh, forms of Islam as an excuse uh, for the uh, torturous and murderous uh, ways in which they maintain power. After Syria, uh, we can talk about Iran and the constant attempts by the United States uh, to discredit, to smear um, the efforts of, of, of Iran to actually help the United States. The, the strongest, uh, most strident voice prior to 9-11 begging the United States to work with it uh, to investigate bin Laden and to steer off uh, that threat uh, was, was Iran. Did we want to listen? No, we didn't want to listen because presumably uh, Iranians are, uh, well, we don't like Iranians because, uh, well, there was that hostage crisis, wasn't there, back in, uh, back in 1980. They kind of humiliated us and we never ever are prepared to forgive anyone who looks as though they might for a moment at least um, have, uh, have humiliated us. What did we do to Iran? Well, we prized uh, within about six months of the uh, Khomeini revolution in 1979, we prized into power, we shoot into power Saddam Hussein in Iraq and within months of uh, Saddam Hussein becoming uh, the president of uh, Iraq. What was he doing? He started to invade Iran. And this was the beginning of the most awful war that went on for eight and a half years uh, at the enormous uh, cost of life, both, both Iraqi uh, and uh, Iranian. And of course, supported by the United States because who wouldn't want to support uh, Sa uh, Saddam Hussein um, uh, if he's attacking your favorite enemy of the day, which is, uh, which is I, I, Iran. And, the, and you know what? The, the one thing that the Iranians did not do, they suffered dreadfully. They kind of, the war ended in a sort of stalemate. Saddam Hussein was using chemical weapons that he got from the United States. The, the, all, all the stuff came from the NATO powers as, as usual to make the chemical weapons. Uh, so Saddam Hussein actually uses chemical weapons against, uh, against the Iranians. What does, what does Khomeini do? Uh, in reprisal, he says to his people, uh, weapons of mass destruction, whether we're talking about chemical weapons or we're talking about, they are evil. They are evil, they are sinful. Iran will never ever use them. And he means what he says because there's no record, there is no credible record uh, of Iran using chemical weapons against, uh, against Iraq. They were perfectly prepared to send these human waves tens of thousands of young men, just uh, wave, forceful waves against much, much better armed Iraqi, armed by us, of course, uh, much, much better armed uh, Iraqi uh, troops who were just slaughtered in their tens of thousands. Iran was prepared to do that, but it was not prepared to use chemical weapons uh, against uh, Saddam Hussein. And it will never be prepared to use nuclear weapons against anyone. One, because it doesn't have any nuclear weapons. All it has is a rather very, very small scale uh, nuclear energy program. And yes, probably it finds some kind of political advantage, though it hasn't really worked much uh, to, uh, to, to, any, to any degree of physical evidence. It, it probably likes to use the threat of um, 
of, of um, spiking its uh, supplies of uranium up towards a level where the, the, it can be actually quite useful for um, uh, the kind of um, chemicals that are needed for the uh, for the healthcare of cancer patients and so on, which is about, I think I'm saying, 40 percent uh, enrichment. And uh, uh, but you need about you need 90 percent enrichment uh, to actually get anywhere near uh, creating an, a nuclear uh, weapon. And then you need the missiles that can actually carry um, uh, the, the nuke warheads. Uh, in any uh, sensible way. Why would Iran ever want to do that, knowing that right next door, Israel has got between 100 and 200 nuclear warheads and has done since the 1960s. Why doesn't the United States uh, ever confess uh, that, this, that this is the case? Because it's totally well known uh, to anyone who's looking for more than, for, for, for more than five minutes at these issues. Uh, well, it's because the United States knows that under the terms of the uh, Nuclear Pro Proliferation Treaty, um, they cannot, they, it is illegal for the United States to give aid to Israel if Israel has nuclear weapons and has not signed the nuclear proliferation, uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty. That is why the United States cannot ever bring itself to confess, oh, yeah, well, actually, all this stuff about Iran being a nuclear threat is, when you look at it uh, for more than one minute, is total bullshit, excuse my language. Um, and, and so the dread, this dreadful saga continues on and on and on, decade after decade after decade. Who, whose advantage is all this nonsense? Is this total charade? Well, it's mainly Israel's, uh, because Israel, the one thing that Israel fears the most, uh, knowing that Saudi Arabia is totally in the pocket, the Saudi Arabia, the people who attacked us on 9-11, uh, Saudi Arabia is totally in the pocket of the United States. Um, knowing that it's, it's one true threat um, of regional influence is, is Iran. How does it know that? Because back in the days of the Shah, um, we were pouring all of our um, weapons into uh, behind the Shah of Iran. Uh, Israel meant nearly almost nothing to us until 1979. Um, the Shah of Persia, with all of his uh, uh, torture-loving uh, torture secret police, he was our guy. He was our policeman uh, while we suffer the uh, uh, the, the um, suffered the oil shock of the late 1970s. And then, uh, well, then Khomeini comes along and then we switch our attention and our love uh, to, uh, to Israel. And Israel is desperate to retain that connection with the United States because it knows that should Iran ever come back into the picture as a credible international, uh, credible regional leader, Israel, it doesn't go down the chute, but it becomes a much, much smaller fish in the, in, in, in the Middle Eastern pool. So um, I, I know I've, uh, I've talked much, much too much and I uh, will force myself to shut up at this point. <laughs> Mark, you did great, Oliver. Thank you so much. I was impressed with the uh, Brzezinski reference that I've, I've been reading about. He was a kid in Poland when the Russians invaded. So you can imagine he had a great disdain for the, you know, the Russian uh, political uh, oppression that happened to him in his youth. Also, I, I made a connection I've been thinking about, you have Steven Donziger, and I don't know if you're familiar with this case with Chevron, and they, like, the, the Justice Department is allowing Chevron lawyers to prosecute this guy who won a lawsuit against Chevron. I mean, isn't there a conflict of interest there? And tying that possibly to Karzai, uh, who was the head of uh, Afghanistan, who was the leader who was being paid to, to draw Russia into Afghanistan. You know, you said the U.S. was supporting these, the Taliban at one point, and here was Karzai. And then when we take over, he becomes the president. He was working with Chevron, too. So I think Chevron's got this big hubris that they can do whatever they want. And, you know, we're, we're the big players in the world and, and whatever. I mean, do you see yeah. anything that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've just been uh, i just been rereading. There's a, lot, a wonderful book by uh, Lucy uh, Lucy Edwards, who was uh, an aid worker in Afghanistan in uh, uh, in 2001. I think she was out there for four or five years, and uh, she tells this wonderful story, amongst others, of the uh, of the lawyer Hirger. The United States took great credit in, in bringing back democracy uh, to. Uh, to Afghanistan after after our invasion, and you, you you may remember we put a lot of effort behind the the calling of a of a, of a lawyer Hiraga, a meeting of the of, of all of the principal 
um, political forces in Afghanistan. And it, 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 and it sounded wonderful. Uh, but you know what, uh, in order to, to make this work, they, they had to bring back a lot of the warlords from various parts of the Middle East and further afield uh, who had left Afghanistan after the, uh, after the victory over the, over the Russians. We're talking about really, really horrible people uh, like Dostum, uh, who killed uh, hundreds of not thousands of uh, Taliban by sealing them in uh, containers and uh, just letting them to rot and to die. Uh, and Hek Machia and, and, and others of that ilk. So the, the so-called lawyer Herdiger of 2002, which, which was supposed to be the voice for the new democratic pro-gender rights, et cetera, and so forth, Afghanistan, was a total joke. It was a farce. Under the eyes uh, of, of the British and American uh, troops, the, the warlords came in, they dictated uh, what people could say. They made it very clear that if you said the wrong thing, uh, your uh, notes were being taken and uh, the reprisals would, uh, would occur later. In the meantime, our man, our ambassador to Afghanistan, Khalil Saad, was uh, negotiating in another tent uh, with the warlords, uh, with the people who had the actual power uh, in Afghanistan. And they were the people um, who you know, chose uh, Karzai. Uh, the, 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 the former king of Afghanistan, um, uh, he was present, uh, but any time he stood up to speak, the microphone was shut off. He, the, he, he was quite popular. He was a, quite a popular leader. People remembered his period in power quite fondly because it had been quite peaceful. Things had actually been quite good for women at that period of time. Uh, but um, Professor, Professor yeah. Daoud, Daoud has a question as well. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Yeah. We have a question, Dowd. Did you want to go ahead? Yeah, well, whenever he's, whenever he can conclude his point, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts on like the. Oh, shit. Oh, and uh, so the actions that, that I so the actions that took place in the Abu Ghraib prison in uh, Iraq, okay. um, how they justified it by saying they were rogue soldiers and um, pretty much just dehumanized all the prisoners that was in there. Is that a question for me, Daoud? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Um, yes, of course, that was an extremely uh, bad business. But of course, the press represented that as, yes, as you say, uh, a few bad apples. Um, but the United States, uh, unfortunately, has a very sad record in the business of torture and war. And it's very rarely... Uh, gets through the uh, mainstream media. And in the case of our crimes in uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, it, 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 it took, how long did it take? Well, it, it took many decades uh, before the, the truth, uh, the, the real impact of our practice of torture in Vietnam uh, began. Even, uh, even now, it, it, it's, it's usually softened. The punches are always pulled in our mainstream media when it comes to uh, talking about the practice of torture uh, in the areas of the world where we fight and, where, and which we occupy. And, uh, and, and as a counterinsurgency practice, it's a very hard, it's at the very heart of US uh, counterinsurgency practice, uh, well, I'm gonna say from Korea onwards and probably uh, from, 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 uh, from before then. So the notion that Abu Ghraib was, uh, was something exceptional, I, I regret to say, no, this is totally in line uh, with how the United States uh, conducts its counterinsurgency practices. I was interested to hear um, Scott Ritter the other day say that the only thing really that the United States has managed to uh, learn over the last 50 years has basically been counterinsurgency. In the meantime, our understanding of actual war has, has just disappeared. And, and, and that's, that's the, you know, in as much as there's a real threat to US uh, interest at the moment, it is from uh, the countries who have been continuing to learn about real warfare, uh, something a different, more, uh, something other than uh, counterinsurgency. And, uh, and, and those countries are, of course, China and, uh, and Russia. So yeah, we should beware the day when uh, uh, we, we seem to be thirsting, lusting uh, for war against Russia. How stupid is that uh, on the basis um, of our false claims that uh, Russia is the evil guy who stole Crimea. Who the, who the hell cares in the United States who Crimea belongs to? But I care at least in as much as uh, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the Crimeans were perfectly entitled and right uh, to insist on protection from uh, the anti-Russian uh, 
uh, regime that came to power in Ukraine in 2014 and cried out to Russia, can please, uh, please annex us. Uh, th there's no surprise there because anyone who's actually looked at the history of Crimea well understands that the majority of the population are pro-Russian, speak Russian, are Russophile. Yes, there are some uh, anti-Russians there as well, the Tatars, but they are in a strict minority. And any opinion poll uh, that I have seen, and there are many credible opinion polls, uh, both from 2014 up to the present day, are, cl are very clear in demonstrating that uh, the, pop the uh, majority population in Crimea is entirely happy with the outcome of, event of, uh, of events in 2014. Well, thank you, Doctor. Um, I had another question for you um, about uh, the uh, the moves by the uh, the former administration and uh, Mike Pompeo to consolidate support for Israel by feigning up these uh, agreements between these what you would think would be adversary countries but and, and in trade like say Morocco got West Sahara and uh, as an occupied state now at, to do with whatever they want according to the United States and this is almost akin to what's been going on in Palestine and Israel so they're fortifying these right-wing uh, trends trends or trenchants I don't know what the word would be but uh, you see what's going on there do you have anything to say about that uh, I, I have to admit, I, um, I, I'm not too well versed uh, on, on, on the events in the, uh, in, in, in the Western Sahara, uh, other than to, uh, uh, to, to totally concede the point that uh, the imperialist uh, struggle uh, in Africa is, is, is as intense now as, uh, as it has ever been. And we, uh, we perhaps play the game a little bit with a, a, a slightly more subtlety, perhaps, and with greater... Uh, unembarrassed uh, use of uh, proxy armies um, to uh, to de to deliver the to deliver the results for us. If I might be so bold, uh, because it is something very fresh and I find incredibly disturbing. Uh, and I'll come back to Israel in a second. But it is the way in which uh, uh, I do think that the U.S. departure from Afghanistan uh, is an an enormous administrative uh, joke. It's a failure. Uh, and people should be held accountable for it. It should not have happened in the way that it did. I don't think the United States really has left Afghanistan. I think, as Biden has already made clear, uh, it's going to be succeeded by, uh, what does he call it? Uh, well, by forms of drone warfare and, I guess, uh, sanctions and all the other ways that we've come up with to bring countries down to their knees, or at least we think we're going to bring them down to their knees. But that actually never seems to happen. It, even, it actually seems to make them more and more resilient. But how terrible... And how, um, uh, well, yes, how, how, how humiliating, how shameful that in those last moments of the U.S. presence, uh, that, well, combat presence in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, following what may have been but may not have been uh, a terrorist bomb in uh, Kabul airport, uh, our reprisal uh, takes out a, a guy who's got nothing to do with it and seven of his children. I mean, I, I think this in itself should be in any decent country, in any decent peace respecting country, this should be a matter of national shame. We as a country should go into mourning for a month and wear black out of shame for this crime that is so representative of our carelessness, of our slovenliness, of our misunderstanding, uh, our stupidity in the ways in which we conduct war uh, invasions and their subsequent uh, occupations. Yeah, this should never happened in the first place, obviously, but uh, we had to do something. And, and of course, there's talk about the drone bombings to continue. Is that true? That's going on there in Afghanistan and the, the well, preparation, the lack of preparation for the former administration who didn't, who couldn't even run the country, let alone, you know, deal with what's left over in Afghanistan, they could probably care less in so many words, but. Well, of course it is early days. Uh, there does seem to be continue, although the Taliban claim that they have uh, uh, defeated the, uh, what used to be called the Northern Alliance uh, forces of um, Ahmad uh, uh, Massoud, who's, a, who's the son, relatively un 
unknown quantity, um, uh, Ahmad uh, Masood, who, who is the uh, son of the legendary um, uh, Northern, Northern, Northern Alliance leader, uh, Masood, who was, uh, who was uh, shot, who was executed, assassinated a couple of days before the, uh, before the events of 9-11. Um, that's a whole other story. And then he was working, the, his, his son has been in alliance with a guy who was the vice president of Afghanistan under Ghani, who was the most recent uh, Afghani president until the Taliban uh, victory. And uh, that vice president was um, 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 Rula um, Saleh, uh, who is a known uh, CIA asset. Uh, so the CIA was putting up, you know, through Saleh and through Masood, they were putting up, I guess, a large a last uh, ditch uh, resistance against the Taliban. Who knows whenever the, when the, when when these things will ever end? They probably weren't, and there was so much scope for the United States to uh, cause trouble in uh, Afghanistan by uh, supporting or by allowing or by in some way permitting um, uh, weapons and um, militia to the ISIS K. Uh, another yeah, I, ISIS has this habit of kind of coming at you from nowhere. Uh, no one really knows who they are funded until many years later. And then many years later, you find it's uh, this or that uh, um, Arab nation, uh, perhaps with or without the, uh, the, 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 the wink of the eye from the United States or from one or another of the NATO uh, nations. But they are there. Their purpose clearly now is to make sure that the Taliban don't get too powerful. So there's someone who's going to be keeping the Taliban uh, in check. Uh, the United States makes a lot of uh, noise about oh, how terrible it is, that uh, terrible it is that Russia and China look to be uh, seeking advantage uh, from the United States withdrawal, as though this is some terrible sin, as though this is something totally unheard of uh, in the whole history, entire history of, uh, of, of foreign policy, that one nation uh, should try to take advantage of developments in a neighboring uh, nation. But in the case of China, I'm inclined to think that should, and I think it will happen, because the Taliban keeps saying that the uh, Chinese are their most promising new ally, and why not? Uh, the Taliban have a very clear role to play for China and uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, first and foremost, uh, by, by just <laughs> repeat of history, you see, just as we had uh, our pipeline plans back in the back in the 1990s uh, with uh, with Unical and Enron. Uh, now the Chinese are looking to Afghanistan uh, for the, the, the they will bring the uh, the Caspian oil uh, 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 to China and China badly. Uh, badly needs this. And um, I think uh, China will likely do a far more effective job at development in, of Afghanistan because it's not interested in, 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 at least at this point of history, who knows what's going to come in the future, is not interested in investing billions in, uh, in a military presence. And what freedom that gives you. If you're not bothered about paying billions of dollars for a military presence, Think of what, you, what the other things you can do for just a fraction of that amount, which will actually be good uh, for, uh, for, the, for the people. <laughs> yeah, well, so, they, got, uh, they, they own plenty of our, our debt. So, you know, they, they're swaggering, you know, and they don't care. It. And, and, and I, I, I hope they do a lot of good, you know, in terms of being a social force on the planet. This is why China has stood for so long, because they are more socially oriented. The United States, you say socialism, and it's, you know, all bets are off. But this is what makes the planet united. And if you don't have a certain amount of, quote unquote, socialism, then things aren't going to progress. I, it's, it's nominal. You go to business, people work, they talk to each other. That's socialism. Big deal. You know, get over it, capitalists. It's going to happen. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Stephen, totally. But I am very, very worried about the, uh, the, the, the beating of the drums for war now against China, which I think is a totally lost cause right from the beginning. Well, uh, if only America could, could learn to compete by actually developing other countries rather than destroying them, that would be a really great start. And in the meantime, I think, uh, although I'm not wanting, I'm not prepared at this moment to excuse China for any wrongs that it may be occurring. Uh, in uh, Xinjiang against the uh, the, the Uyghur uh, people. I, I also have the gravest doubts about that particular narrative. Uh, and I just wish that we had more, uh, a more balanced uh, journalistic uh, approach to that, um, to that, to that important issue, uh, because it's going to, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's arisen so conveniently uh, in order to support 
uh, drumming up uh, fear and loathing against China. Uh, again, I suspect on a largely false pretext. I don't say that uh, China has not, uh, has not put a step wrong in its attempt to control the threat of Uyghur-based terrorism. We're talking, by the way, of a population of 26,000, sorry, 26 million, and people forget the numbers. Uh, the Xinjiang has 26 million people, of whom 12 million are Uyghurs, um, and a very, very small proportion of those uh, are committed to radical forms of Islam. Uh, but most are Turkic. Uh, I think most are uh, peace-loving people. And, you know, if there really was a problem in, uh, in Xinjiang, the one, the, the one country that I would suspect, that I would expect to be up in arms about that would be Turkey, because these are all Turkic peoples. There is a line, there's a clear line of connection oh, yeah. from Turkey all the way uh, across Central Asia to West China. And uh, these are all Turkic people. These are all languages sure. that are related to oh, Turkish. Yeah. Is, yep. is Turkey worried about it? No, probably for very good reason. Probably well, because there's actually not that much to worry about. You look at the size of the Chinese population and how many people live there. And if you had to govern all those people, I mean, the United States got 340 million or whatever it is. They've got over how many billion? Billion. I think it's, one, I think it's 1.4 billion now, uh, Stephen. So a little authoritarianism there kind of suppresses the the ranks so that there's no big outbreak of some kind of major rebellion across all those. So, I mean, yeah. that's a responsibility. I'm not making excuses for anybody, mm -hmm. but, you yeah. know, th yeah. there's and, perspective. And, maybe. Yeah. And, and if we, I may, Stephen, just very, very quickly. Stephen and, and Dowd very, has another question. Oh, okay, Dowd. Dowd has another question. Okay. okay. Well, uh, Professor, you've mentioned the Uyghur Muslims, but how could China justify having a relationship with Afghanistan when they hold captive millions of Muslims? Well, we have, we have, uh, Dawood, uh, we, we have to ask the question, is this true? Uh, we, many, I've, writ I've written on this topic, I'm not pretending it's an easy topic uh, to write about. I don't think we can afford to be dismissive um, of gross uh, human rights uh, abuses. We should never be dismissive of claims of, of uh, significant human rights abuse until we are sure we have evidence that points one way or the other. My problem with much of the evidence is some of the evidence is simply false. So for example, uh, the idea that the, there is a serious threat uh, of China wishing to depopulate uh, the, 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 the Uyghurs. Uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, the Uyghur population has actually increased three times uh, in, in China. And uh, the, uh, if, any, if any population has been declining as a result of better birth control and other medical improvements that have been brought about uh, by, the, uh, by the Chinese states, is actually the Han population uh, in Xinjiang more. In other words, the Han population have lost more population than the Uyghurs in Xinjiang over the last, uh, over the last few years. But that doesn't, you know, that, that's just part of the argument. Uh, uh, so what I'm saying is that much of the evidence of atrocities, much of it that I've looked at is highly suspect. It's not coming from people that I believe are sufficiently disassociated from anti-Chinese uh, interests. But do I leave the door open to the possibility of being confounded or being shown that there are significant pro it, it, Does it, it, are we really talking about millions of, of people incarcerated? I, that seems to me to be so unlikely, uh, given the scale of this enterprise, um, and, and also the very strong likelihood of uh, counterproductive uh, um, outcomes of, of, of such a drastic uh, policy. I, I, I personally don't see, I don't buy it that the Chinese would, uh, would, live to the, would, would, would live with it, but I remain open because until we actually have the evidence on the table that we can totally trust, um, we, we, we need to be, act with incredible uh, uh, caution. And I would just finally like to say, uh, in response to Stephen's uh, thoughts about authoritarianism in China, uh, I'm not going to make a judgment right now, uh, an easy judgment about whether or not China is authoritarian or isn't. Uh, but my Chinese friends tell me that the uh, many of the abuses that we read about from mainland China are not the result so much of uh, the, the policies and the actions of Beijing, uh, but are, are state-based or are city-based. Uh, they are the result of political infighting and political cliques 
in particular areas of China, perhaps seeking uh, advantage through the acquisition of land to which they have only dubious right and the expulsion of uh, indigenous peoples from such lands and this, that and the other. But in Beijing, you know, typically the, the tradition is that the people of China look to Beijing with a certain amount of respect and warmth. Why? Because they see Beijing as the agent that is most likely to intercede on their behalf with the power and the resources that are necessary to intercede. So it's a very different dynamic to the dynamic that we're used to in the uh, United States and in, uh, and in some of the other Western countries. That's a lot of area to cover. Thank you, Professor Oliver Boyd Barrett. Thank you so much. Great, very great. great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Take care. You're welcome. Don't You're forget, welcome people, anytime. that he has an event that's on September 14th, and uh, all that information will be emailed to everybody on this uh, call and out to the whole email list to uh, remind them to tune into the war, peace, and uh, propaganda event. Thank you. Thank you Take Thank care. You. Okay, I have an announcement. I know Kathy Cowanbecker, if she is on, also has an announcement. And if anybody else has announcements, they can bring them up now. But first of all, Hot Times is going on right here on the Near East Side in our neighborhood. It is not no longer on Parsons Avenue at the uh, Health Center space. It's at the Douglas School space, which is right behind, uh, if you can picture this, the, right behind the BP that's on East Broad Street, just east of um, what used to be the uh, freeway, <laughs> the entrance ramp for the freeway, which all closed down now. But, um, but yeah, Bob and I were just there this evening and uh, they got the big tent set up. They got a lot of bands. They have some food trucks and some booths. There's people having a great time there. I believe that uh, Willie Phoenix is playing right now as we speak, which I'm sorry to miss, but it's also being ah. live streamed. I know, Brian, were you there just now or... Well, I probably might pop over after we leave this call, but I was oh, there. Okay. Plus, I have a game downstairs. Yeah, I didn't see you there earlier, but Bob and I were just there for an hour, and we got some Indian food, and we saw Lenny, Lynn Stan, and uh, Gail and Eric and a few people. So anyway, I just want to uh, encourage everybody to go there tomorrow. It's still going on all day tomorrow, something like, I guess, 11 or 12 till 10 10 at night or so, and Donna McGavaro is the big singer tomorrow night. I know there's um, music playing all day. So uh, everybody, if you're interested in the live stream, they have a, a site that you can go to. I guess I could put, post the, the link to the live stream site. And then uh, let's see, Kathy, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, is it, I just have a couple of announcements on behalf of Simply Living. Is it okay if I share my screen? Because it might be easier to show them. Should be, Steve, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, everybody's. Okay, let's see if this works. Hopefully we have. All righty, let me put this far down. There you um, go. Yeah, so actually you're looking at our mission statement about connecting people to learning opportunities that promote sustainability, environmental justice in our local economy. So last week we launched um, kind of a major undertaking that's a, that's a bunch of learning opportunities called Sustainable You. And it's something Simply Living has done in the past. Um, and so we are, are basically relaunching it. Um, so we have a page on our website um, called Sustainable You. Um, the navigation is gonna be changed to Sustainable You. This lists several courses that we have coming up um, gosh, in just a week or two, um, that some of them will start. Um, so I'm just going to page through these tabs that are open. Um, the first one is a voluntary simplicity course. Um, this is a course through uh, this an organization called Eco Challenge, formerly Northwest Earth Institute. So um, they we have two courses from them. This is the first one. Um, so this is basically looking at um, consumer culture and society and examining how modern society interferes with caring for the planet and how consumption patterns have an impact on you and your relationships and the environment and how to slow down and live simply. This is like a really core course. And um, the facilitator for this one is Jeff Sharp, who you may know is the director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State. But He's doing this with us because he wants to do it. He wants to look into this in his own life. 
Um, so that, so we, we are running the course. These courses are free if you're a Simply Living member. Um, if you are a current member, then you can take as many as you want. Um, but if you're not a member or not current, then we just ask that you become a member or re-up your membership. So that's what this suggested price is about. But um, And if you are a member, you're welcome to donate a little bit more, but you don't have to. Um, so let's see. Oh, I see this a lot of times. Um, let's see if I can get to the next one. Another one of these Eco Challenge courses is called Seeing Systems. And a lot of what was talked about tonight would fit right in. It's kind of the connections between peace, justice, and sustainability. Um, one thing, and I'm gonna be taking this one myself, this one is being facilitated by a former board member named Dan Barish, um, who's done this one before. Um, and you know, one thing I wanna explore is say we move to a 100% renewable energy and we have no more need for oil, <laughs> what is that going to do to our international relations on this planet? We would be generating energy right here at home. And um, I saw where, which I hadn't actually seen before, where Dick Cheney had a map of Iraq with the actual logos of the oil companies on that map. Like, you know, everyone knew this was a war for oil and <laughs> that seemed to prove it. We don't need any more wars for oil. So that's, um, you know, those are the kinds of themes that will get explored in this course. And it's the same thing. If you're a current member, you're welcome to take it um, with no fee. Um, and if you aren't, then we ask that you join. And, and but both of these two Eco Challenge courses, there is a book um, that you order from, from Eco Challenge. So um, there, is, there is that. And, and I just got the book here for this. It takes about a week for the books to arrive. And we have actually a code to get $10 off of the book. So that, that helps a little bit with the cost of the book. And then a third course, um, our own Chuck Lynn is gonna be doing this one. The first two that I mentioned start the last week of September. This one starts more in October, um, the economics of happiness. And it's all about localism and local food and um, looking at, um, you know, basically the, the happiness, you don't have to have a lot of money or spend a lot of money for happiness and that you can do it on a local level. And you can come to any or all of the classes. Um, the first two, it's helpful if you come to most of them because it's a discussion group. And um, from what I've heard of previous courses, when people um, gather and they have these discussions, like real bonds get formed. And in Dan's class the last time, in that course, they kept meeting because people just became really good friends. So um, Suzanne has also very kindly put all of this into an article on the free press. So if you're having trouble finding any of this, well, here it is. Just go to the free press website and it's all right there and the descriptions and the dates and the formats and the registration. link. And then just the other announcement I wanted to make is um, our major fundraiser of the year is coming up. It's called Gift to be Simple. Um, this one is October 20th, which is a Wednesday night. We're holding it at the Grange Audubon Center, which is in Scioto Audubon Metro Park. Um, and so most of it's going to be, a lot of it's just going to be networking. And, you know, people here, a lot of our members know each other, but they don't get to see each other that much. So, um, you know, meeting and networking. Um, if uh, if we have business sponsors um, or even current business members, they can have tables in like the atrium there. We get we have the whole space so we can really spread out. Um, and we're going to have about a 30 minute presentation just about the history of Simply Living and where we've been and a lot of the other organizations that we've helped launch and, and our sustainability impact on Columbus and Central Ohio. Um, we do ask that the people who attend be vaccinated and we will have, um, we haven't quite worked it all out yet, but we will have some sort of online component for those who don't want to come in person. We understand that that's, you know, with the with current um, COVID rates, uh, we're hoping that um, some of the steps that are being taken will help get that under control, but we are keeping an eye on that. Um, and we're asking that people be masked and we're gonna to talk to the venue about ventilation. There's porches outside. And then, like I said, there's a lot of room to spread out. Um, and then we do have some sponsorship levels if for if an individual wants to or a supporting business. Um, 
So they start at 100 for that. Um, and then we get there's certain benefits. This is something, you know, a lot of nonprofits do this. So we have six levels of sponsorship. And we have a link to sign up for that as well. But I, I just wanted to mention that for um, businesses. And, and the way this will be set up is the bar is going to be in the back corner and the drinks are going to be in the back corner. So if anybody wants to go to that, they're going to have to walk right by all of these tables. Like we don't want these tables in a back corner. We want them accessible and, and have a lot of the event be around um, learning about whatever organizations are tabling at this event. Um, so we have a blog post on our page about this. Um, that, that's where to find all of this all together and we'll have it accessible from our homepage. And um, that's all I've got. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, everybody go to the, we'll post the link to the free press uh, article that lists all that in, a, in the email that I send out. And uh, I think Sandy, you wanted to announce your move to amend conference. Yes. Hi. Um, we are, this is a um, move to men. used to have these annual um, statewide conferences, but because of what happened with COVID, we have divided them up into four a year. So our next one will be this month, September 18th. Um, I posted it before, but I'll post it again in the chat in a minute here. Um, but it's going to be really interesting. It's about the 14th Amendment. And the promises that were made for equal, you know, due process um, and um, equal rep equal protection for everybody, and um, how that was that's been um, diverted to or you know subverted to um, make it possible for corporations to get all this equal protection, which is not very equal for the rest of us. Um, following up on this, it's a really interesting concept because following up on this is uh, Cindy Bur Cynthia Brown, who's going to be talking about qualify Sandy mute it yourself or something somebody muted you sorry um so anyway I don't know where I left off but it'll be the 14th amendment and then followed up with the qualified immunity um qualified immunity is really the opposite you know where, where cops get or officials get immunity no matter what they do no matter how many rights they violate um, of the citizens. So it's really the opposite. So check it out. Um, like I said, I'm going to post it in a second here and you can see where to register for it. Thanks. Thanks, Sandy. Anybody else have any announcements? I know we got a lot of other people on here that are involved in things. Yes. Um, this is Cliff uh, Arnebeck. I just wanted to be sure that everyone is aware that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. has announced a book, uh, the headline of which is uh, Anthony Fauci is the great greatest mass murderer in human history. And I would hope that uh, everybody uh, that's following the COVID-19 and the virus issue, uh, the, the vaccine issue, will look at uh, Bobby Kennedy's uh, uh, website, uh, Children's Health Defense Fund, which is being heavily censored. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Cliff. Uh, has anybody else got anything for the good of the group? It's almost, we've almost gone two hours now, <laughs> as usual. Oh, hey, Suzanne. Go ahead. Hi, this is MJ. Hi, everybody. Uh, I was just putting in the chat two things that pertain here. Number one, um, Suzanne will probably remember an article that I wrote back in 2017 uh, called Remember the, Ra uh, Remember the Rainbow Farm. Um, it might sound kind of arcane, but um, partic particularly in light of the, the professor's discussion, but there is a war on drugs uh, connection to 911. Uh, it appears from the 911 report that uh, the FBI and its field offices, which they had one in Detroit, uh, really took its eye off the ball. It was more interested in drugs and thugs than it was in uh, going after terrorists. And so instead, what the FBI did was the week before, that was a Labor Day weekend before the 911, um, they uh, uh, staged a siege at a campground concert venue called the Rainbow Farm 
which was in South Central Michigan and allegedly had 50 FBI agents there and ultimately shot the proprietors, Tom Crosland and Raleigh Rome, uh, with the sharpshooter, shot and killed them. And um, now to me, my connection is that my, my dad was a, an engineer who helped build the World Trade Center. I remember him as a child going up there into New York, spent a lot of time in New York. And uh, so uh, I, the, that's kind of the, the, uh, the theme for reading things behind my article. But what it was, was he, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it was, we, he really was, he was terribly into Alzheimer's at that time. And if you never say that about a person that you love and say, I'm really glad that, you know, Alzheimer's is still in your memory, you know, it's significant. So I wanted to point out that article. I think I've already put that in the chat. And then my most recent article that was just published about a few days ago, um, I do a thing called Mary Jane's Guide because I'm, well, Mary Jane and I know about marijuana. And that's all true. My name is Mary Jane. I do know a lot about marijuana. And so I, uh, most recent one is on op-ed, op op opposition research, op research, opposite research for our opponents in the cannabis industry, which are extremely well funded to the ton of hundreds of millions of dollars that basically uh, for which there's really no accounting. That's kind of what a re GAO report found. So you can check that out in my most recent article, which I will put in the chat as soon as I'm done talking. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to run the article again, Suzanne, about 911, but it might be apropos. Yeah, send me that again. It'll I'm be in the chat. Do you want me to send it to you? Yeah. Or I get it from the chat. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you, Mary Jane. Mary Jane, I had a question. There's a, uh, we were in Chillicothe and there's Kroger's down there. And in the strip mall there is a family urgent medical care center. And they had a sign out said marijuana card, $25. Have you heard of that? <laughs> 25 Urgent care? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, I have a buddy who's uh, in a nursing home down there who hasn't, doesn't have his card yet and thought it might benefit him. But uh, for 25 bucks, you could supposedly you know, with going through all the footwork there. But anyway, I just thought I'd let you know about that. No, it's kind of weird, sounds fishy it? because usually, well, you have to get a recommendation from a doctor who is certified to recommend by the state of Ohio. Right. And usually they'll charge normal doctor's fees, which you know are upwards of you know, 100 to $200. Now, it, it, if they're doing $25 and they're certified to recommend, that is a hell of a deal. But I would look them up and make sure that they are certified. You can go to the website of the Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program, uh, just to Google it. And there's a section there that has the list of all of the physicians, at least who are publicly going to tell you that they're right. certified to recommend right. and, a, and a little map you can click on. So go there first to see if he's on there. Or this, this individual, okay. whoever it is, is that, that they're talking about is on there. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, Mark? Yeah, the, 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 this is Bob Ream. I have posted 50 events in the Free Press Calendar and website. I don't remember them all. I'm not going to try to tell you what they are. <laughs> if you go to the website, you can see what they are. Thank you so much, Bob. We so appreciate your volunteering to Thank keep that you, up Bob, to for that You're up. doing a great job. Hey, Steve, I guess to wrap up, did, did you want to announce when the next Harvey uh, and Joel Siegel event is? Yes, Monday. We had a little breather from Memorial uh, Labor Day last weekend, was that? And uh, so last week. So this Monday at 5 p.m. in a couple days, we'll have the regular grassrootsep.org. Uh, Zoom with national guests, uh, Ray Lutz and a bunch of other national election integrity folks there. Um, runs for about two hours and uh, you can ask questions, participate and uh, see what's going on on the national level. Right now in the spotlight is California um, with their recall election. The polls are looking to favor the incumbent and uh but everybody's you know sitting on the edge waiting to see what happens here and and ready to uh, step into action if, if it 
called for. So um, there's a lot of talk on another listserv. Uh, so that's grassrootsep.org, or as Harvey says, election protection 2024.org. Election protection 2024.org, and that'll take you right to grassroots EP. Um, Dot org same site same place um, the information there is listed in upcoming <clears throat> zooms and of course the zoom link is undescribable uh, vocally so you'll just have to go to grassrootsep.org and find upcoming zooms and you'll be able to get in five o'clock monday thank you so much <laughs> and mark i saw mark came back in are you able to talk what was that i'm sorry Oh, I was just, I saw that I admitted you back in, so I didn't know if you wanted to wrap up since you came back. Oh, uh, just thank you for everybody. Uh, great way to uh, commemorate the 9-11 plus 20. Um, we got to keep on keeping our uh, resistance building and uh, understanding how our community is very, very important in Central Ohio. Uh, community. Uh, the Columbus Free Press community is very important, and we need to sustain it and keep moving towards having younger younger voices write and and uh, speak uh, within our community. So, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for all your work.